So there's not, not a lot of graphics and there's a lot of words. So maybe I can start anyways uh, while we solve that issue. Oh, there he goes. Okay, so um, perfect. Thank you. So I'm presenting this really not in my official capacity in the sense that I haven't reviewed these slides uh, with LSSTC or LSST project. Uh, so this is my summary, personal summary, of the reading of the various code of conducts and um, bylaws and um, documentation on behavioral patterns that are to be held at LSST meetings and in general in the LSST collaboration. Um, so the LSST um, organization altogether, as we said, is rather complex and it includes LSSTC, LSST project, science collaborations. There we go. Thank you. Um, the science collaborations. And so there's actually a fair number of things that have been written about the code of conduct in all these various environments. Um, generally speaking, they arise from very broad and general bylaws that most organ organizations, most um, organizations such as the American Astronomical Society or the European Astronomical Societies have, which are really just statements about the fact that these environments should be non-discriminating um, and run in, in the same sense in which the laws about discrimination apply. From the bylaws, we go to codes of conduct, which are a series of rules um, that define behavior such that these laws can be implemented. And in addition to that, there are principles of engagement, which are sort of low rules that are um, not strictly addressing issues such as sexual harassment or discrimination by any um, category uh, protected by the law, but they still regulate our behavior such that we can be a most, the most productive community. So the code of conduct for LSSD, as I mentioned, there's a few. Uh, generally, all these documents uh, refer to um, statements and guidelines that have been developed in larger societies, like the Astro American Physical Society, uh, which has all these things are links, so you can pick them up when you get the slides. Uh, which discusses in detail the fact that the American Astronomical Society believes that the following are minimal standards of ethical behavior relating to profession and describes conduct towards others, so being ethically and respectful, um, being um, avoiding harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination by any of the categories pro uh, protected by the law. Uh, behavior in research, so do not appropriate of other people's research and give credit when, uh, when credit is due uh, towards publication, and we will probably get to talk about the publication policies uh, for LSST and some of the science collaborations later when we talk about the submission process, peer review, and conflicts of interest. These are minimal standards. And um, again, uh, that don't cover all of the interaction that you may have in the LSST environment. This is a list of documents that LSST has produced about code of conduct. Um, and so there's a specific code of conduct for all the communication environments. That includes community, the portal, uh, that is a stack overflow alike, um, includes Slack, and includes private communication between LSST members. There is an LSST um, um, code of conduct for developers, so for people that are in the project, and there are various codes of conduct for various um, science collaborations. Generally, these things are similar in that they arise and this, they begin from the same principles that, have been, that I was discussing earlier. Uh, most of what I'm going to mention now refers to the code of conduct for meetings at LSST, because we are at an LSST meeting, uh, which is, as of now, only written specifically meeting by meeting. So what I'm referring to is the code of conduct that has been developed for the last LSST project workshop um, in 2018, August, in Tucson. So the ethical behavior of the, um, of the AAS um, covers sexual harassment, definition of other harassment, definition of discrimination and retaliation. And also things like how do you report an incident, how do you begin an investigation so that you can protect both the victim and the perpetrator, and, and what is the disciplinary action that should be taken. I'm mentioning it here because I find that most people that talk about these things haven't actually read 
uh, these definitions. And these definitions may be more subtle um, than you think. So sexual harassment refers to any conduct that, uh, any sexual attention that is undesired, but really also um, sexual innuendos that may be constructed as attention that is undesired. Um, and so on and so forth. So I recommend that these things are read by people that organize meetings um, and by people that um, chair the meetings, chair the various sessions in the meetings. Um, specifically for meeting organizers, the, uh, I'm swapping between AAS, um, APS, and EAS. So this is the European Astronomical Society um, list of recommendations for meeting organizers. Um, and I've highlighted a few that I think are particularly important. It is advised, in fact, to collect gender um, on the participants, on the chairs, and on the organization committee. Um, this is delicate because, especially with the new regulations about privacy, collecting gender may actually uh, needs to be done in a, in a very conscious um, way. Otherwise, one is at risk of actually violating laws. But it is important that we collect data on gender because if we don't know things like gender um, and, and ethnicity um, and any diversity on any other axis, if we don't have the basic data about what the breakdown is, then we cannot address the problem of improving diversity along those axes. Uh, a lot of these studies and a lot of these guidelines generally refer to uh, the inclusion of women in science, because the inclusion of women in science is an obvious um, problem in the sense that women have been uh, it's been known that they're underrepresented in the sciences, and it's actually easier to address the issue because there is a legal definition of gender. So it is possible to collect gender information and um, have statistics on the gender breakdown of your meetings. So for example, it is recommended that meetings provide childcare so that um, women are not, um, are not disfavored from participating to meetings. Another thing that I wanted to point out is uh, presenters should be encouraged to use color palettes and fonts that are suitable for colorblind and dyslexic participants. This may start to sound like things are really micromanaged, but this is really crucial. Um, one person in 10 suffers from some um, color blindness, one man in seven. So if the color palettes that are used in presentation have a lot of greens and reds, the audience is not included and the science message is not propagated fairly. Um, so, and it goes both ways, right? There is an issue of fairness because you are actually cutting out uh, a, par a, a, portion of, a portion of your audience, but also you're not delivering the message to all of your audience, so you're losing some of your audience because of this. I'm actually slightly obsessed with this. So every time I refer you a paper, I always find at least one plot that is not colorblind compliant. I always point that out. I always get an email by the editors that thank me for doing that. And generally, um, the writers are embrace the comments quite enthusiastically. So uh, this is one of my, my pet peeves. Um, for session chairs, there's actually a lot of very interesting material and literature that is being developed about how to optimally chair a session for inclusion. Um, and a couple of things have to do with how you take questions, obviously, uh, in addition to how you generally organize the session. Um, and this is a really crucial point, to take questions from people that are less vocal than others is really um, helping inclusion of women, inclusion of minorities, and inclusion of junior people. And it turns out that the return is not about only about ethics. Again, it's not only about including these people um, that otherwise may be excluded and marginalized, but it's also that we believe that diversity actually fosters creativity and fosters a better understanding and a better development of science through the representation of points of view that are different. Um, Davenport uh, et al, and there's a couple of studies that Jake Davenport has conducted at various AAS meetings, American Astronomical Society meetings, which is the big annual meeting um, in the United States. Um, about participation of women and actually how women ask questions in talks. And a couple of things that are really interesting here. Um, for one thing, women, women are asked slightly more questions than men. Uh, this is the second plot here. Um, women tend to ask fewer questions in proportion to their representation to the meeting. Um, and it, the number of questions that are asked by women depends quite strongly on who's chairing, on the gender of the person that is chairing the session. And it is not clear, at least it's not clear to me, whether that's because um, 
a non-male chair is maybe more likely to be attentive and, and, and um, allow uh, non-males to ask questions, or it's because women are simply more comfortable asking questions in sessions that are chaired by women. So it remains to be seen what the cause of this is. But also this is super interesting to me. The gender of the first question that is being asked um, strongly determines the gender of the people that ask the following questions. Strongly is a big word, the signal is not huge, uh, but it's significant, at least in this plot, it's significant at least in some of the meetings. So the way to read this slightly complicated plot is this is the gender of the person that asks the first question, and then uh, this is the number of female that would ask the f a question in the session if the first question is asked by a female as opposed to if the question is asked by a male, and this is the gender of female that would, ask the first quest, uh, that would ask a question if the first question is asked by a male. So the ratio is significantly different, at least in some of the sessions. Um, and again, the same issue about the cause of this applies, uh, whether it is that chairs may be more inclined to, to accept questions by women, or whether it is that women feel more comfortable in those environments to ask questions. But the reason why I'm, why I'm really stressing this is because this is a very easy thing to fix. If this signal is true, as a chair, all you have to do is try to favor women when you accept the first question. And that may actually break the gender breakdown, um, in the gender barriers in question asking. So those are general um, code of conduct recommendations. So they're sort of broader and um, um, broader issues of diversity and inclusion. But LSSD also obeys by some principles of engagement. These are sort of softer rules um, for which um, if violated, uh, there is uh, less of a compelling argument and less of a compelling uh, motivation to take action, but they should be highlighted and they should be uh, addressed. Uh, so basically the idea is the code of conduct covers uh, larger topic, very significant topics such as harassment, policy, uh, publication conduct, intellectual property, but there are more subtle ways in which we interact with each other, they may actually disfavor um, the diversity and inclusion, uh, the diversity and inclusive environment, inclusive environment that we're trying to achieve. So um, these rules, um, before I tell you what the rules are. So <laughs> this is a pretty horrifying slide that I made last night. Uh, there is a, um, um, a group and a website called Geek Feminism that deals with inclusion of women in tech in general. So this is not only about astronomy. And in fact, astronomy is much more inclusive than generally the broad tech fields are. Um, so this, re this particular compilation is a compilation of reported documents of sexism uh, in the tech community as a whole. So in software development, in the, so in, the, in the tech industry, as well as in the gaming industry, which is obviously uh, and very well known um, to be um, guilty of a lot of um, sexist incidents. But this was pretty shocking to me when I looked at it. In 2014 alone, there were 80 reported incidents of sexism at meetings or in companies. So these are things that, you know, and they're not just, um, perceived and reported to um, the person that is compiling them at Geek Feminism, these are things that are well documented and they had a follow-up uh, on the social media or else consequences within the company or within the meeting. And some of these are very obviously against the code of conduct. Uh, one of these incidents is the uh, Eco Polytech massacre when a um, during a, um, a meeting that the Eco Polytech, um, 14 women were killed uh, by a man who was targeting women on purpose. Um, so obviously, you know, murder is covered by the code of conduct and by the laws. But there are some rather more subtle things that are really affecting our inclusion. Um, this is 2016, so just a couple of years back. Um, this is a PayPal panel on gender equality and inclusion in the workplace. So what's wrong with this picture? Dumb man, which is hilarious because there is a TV show in the US that had exactly this plot and it was so funny when there was that episode. And then it, they just did that, exactly that. Uh, excuse me, for downstairs at the reception, they found a backpack uh, and they, uh, they're wondering if some of us uh, uh, forgot the backpack downstairs because they're calling police uh, to check it out. So if you 
I will not forget any belonging. <laughs> it's not a problem, but just check it out. Okay? Sorry. Um, excuse, eh? No, no, it's all male. It's also pink, which is rather disturbing. Um, so these principle of engagements help us making sure that our interactions, all of our interactions, are uh, fair and move us towards inclusion. Um, and the, the principles of engagement that LSST is adopting are four simple principles. They come from the RECURS um, code of conduct and principles of engagement. RECURS is a, an organization that um, educates on coding. So they do um, coding camps, essentially, in New York. Um, the first one is to raise all voices. So again, as a chair, um, make sure that you accept questions and you encourage questions from the more quiet members of the audience. Uh, make sure that that is very clear and in fact explicitly said at the beginning of the session that junior people uh, should feel comfortable asking questions. Um, and as an audience member, to try, try to listen to all the questions and all the answers instead of trying um, to, instead of waiting to speak and trying to give your peace of mind only. And no further surprise, this is a very common thing that is uh, being done in interactions. I can't believe that you don't know it, or um, I, uh, I can't believe that you haven't heard about this yet. Um, this applies less to talks and more to just social interaction during uh, working time, uh, but it really curbs one's enthusiasm for asking questions. And we think that asking questions, we collectively, um, as community of science that think about these things, think that asking questions actually helps all of the people, the people that are asking the question to learn something new, uh, the people that may have the answer to think about the answer for themselves. And if there is a question by one person, most likely somebody else there also doesn't know the answer to that. No, well, actually, so I just spent three days here with my dad. My dad is especially on well, actually, he loves to like correct tiny little things that you do and just make sure that everything is straight. So, you know, like I was looking inside of a window and I saw that they had a, a sopalco and I called it a mansarda. He loves that, especially now that I live in America, he loves to correct my Italian. Oh, that is not a mansarda, that is a sopalco. This is a completely different thing. So this is just the idea of making sure that when you correct something, somebody, you are doing that for the purpose of um, providing a positive contribution to the discussion and not just nitpicking on other people's um, ideas, thoughts, and wording. Uh, not that this doesn't intend to encourage inaccuracy in the way we do science, of course, uh, but perhaps not, not all corrections further, um, further the discourse and improve the discussion. And then obviously no isms, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, any kind of ism or bias. But this is covered by the code of conduct, um, except that it's also here because uh, we want to highlight that this is not only um, open and explicit sexist or racist uh, or transphobic behavior, but also more subtle cues of such a thing. So the example that they gave, it took me a while to understand the complexity of it. And, and I thought it was quite silly, but I, now I fully embrace it. It's an expression that is common in English is, it's so easy that my grandma could do that. And it's really ageist to suggest that your grandma, despite being old and therefore being useless, can actually do some things that are as easy as this one. So it's offenses, offensive on multiple levels. So those are the, um, the subtle isms. And again, this is not intended to micromanage um, interaction, but just to make people think about the uh, consequences of what they do. There is a lot of implicit bias and there is a lot of um, implicit um, um, self-deprecation um, on the part of the underrepresented minorities. Um, so perpetrating these things and uh, perpetrating these isms in both an overt or a subtle way actually enforces um, that bias and enforces what Sarah was talking about, the feeling of self-deprecation and the feeling of isolation um, on the part of underrepresented minorities. So I think it is important to point out uh, that for the principles of engagement, again, the consequences for breaking these things obviously can't be huge because these are very small things. Um, so if you find yourself um, having violated one of the principles of engagements that govern the LSST meetings, you just should acknowledge and apologize and, and then move on and 
the way in which people say that is not make it about yourself. So do not make a big deal about it because it, then you actually are making the, um, the issue about yourself instead of about the underrepresented minorities. And, and if you see somebody uh, violating one of these principles, um, it may be uncomfortable, so you may want to just point it out to somebody more senior, one of the organizers, um, or just lightly point it out to the person that perpetrates them um, in a way that they may understand that they are violating these principles and that those things have consequences. That's it. Many thanks to Sara and Federica. <laughs> to illustrate this important.